Hi, everyone. Um, I think we're going to wait until a few more people join, but um, thanks for coming. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Zoom call. Um, my name is Mary, and I started the um, I started the Study Buddies program under the Ladies of Hope Ministries. And I'm so happy that you guys are all interested in this program. It's it's new and we're planning on launching soon um, with goals to start our month, our weekly meetings in January. And I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce Topeka Sam here with us to kind of talk to us talk to us about her story and the need for criminal justice reform and um, just everything in between. She's She was the inspiration for Study Buddies and um, she continues to be my inspiration. So um, I'm so excited that you all meet her. Um, yeah. Um, to be good, do you wanna say hi? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mary. Uh, good evening, everyone. So happy that you were able to join uh, Mary as inspired by me as I am of you. Very, very happy to see this program coming to life and excited to see all the participants who have signed up. So I'm sure people will be joining while we're here together this hour, but also who are here and dedicated to this work, uh, to this program, to you, Mary, and supporting children of incarcerated parents. So I'm excited to be in conversation with you this evening. Topeka, um, joining us today uh, on Zoom are a wonderful group of uh, students in high school who are who are trying to be study buddies, and um, and some new faces that are interested in the program. And so I thought I would start um, and talk to you, have a little bit of an interview for about thirty minutes with some introductory questions, and then we can open it up to the group for a Q and A. So anything you're interested in, all like she. To be as happy to answer, and you can just go ahead and put your questions in the Q and A box at the bottom. And um, yeah, so I'm ready to get started. So, Topeka, um, can we start with the story you told me about your own experience in prison and the injustices you witnessed both inside and after your release, as you observed others on parole? Sure. So. I, you know, Mary, when we met, it was probably a long time ago. So I don't know which part of the story that I shared, uh, but where would you like me to start? Would you like me to start with a part of like who I am? Uh, or do you want me to start from my experience in prison and what led me through the work? I'd love to hear, um, just start with who you are. Okay, so uh, who I am, I'm Topeka K. Sam, the founder and executive director of the Ladies of Hope Ministries. Our work, uh, we say, is epic to end poverty and incarceration of women and girls globally. Um, and I came to this work from just my lived experience, one of incarceration, but as a New Yorker uh, who grew up in Manorville and had parents who were franchise business owners, 
they actually owned a Carvel ice cream franchise. And I always laugh and say, I was always the coolest kid in school because I bought everybody an ice cream cake for their birthday. But through that, uh, my friends, we were the only black family in our neighborhood. And so um, I didn't, I mean, of course I knew that I was a black girl, but those are my friends and that's just what it was. Um, and when I speed up to when it was time for me to go to college, I decided to go to an HBCU, which is a historically black college and university, they call it, um, in Baltimore, Maryland. So I went to Morgan State University. I chose Morgan State because I wanted to be to a school that had other kids of color. And so I went there and life was completely different than it was in Manorville. And so I'm now in the city, I'm away from my parents for the first time. And you know, that can be a little bit challenging for a girl who was very, very sheltered um, and just learning about life and learning about being on my own. And yet also learning about who I was and trying to connect more with just other black kids uh, because it was the first time in my life that I was actually at a school with other black kids. And so because I was a little different um, again, being from where I was from, you know, kids would say to me, you talk like you're white or, you know, you're pretty to be dark skinned and all these things. And I had no idea what any of it really meant. Um, and I remember calling my mom and asking, like, what are they talking about? And then there was a whole conversation around like colorism and other things that actually happen in uh, communities of color, which I'm sure we'll get to when we start talking about um, like the criminal legal system and history of racism and things in the country. Um, but to fast forward, I began dating when I was in college, really, for the most part, and I began dating guys who weren't at my college, and they were from the city, and um, then I started dating guys who were selling drugs, and eventually I thought, well, I was smarter, and I can do it better, and so then I found myself selling drugs, and this began to be a cycle, um, and if I would get in trouble, it was no problem, I had access to resources, and I wouldn't you know, go to jail, I wouldn't have a record, it was these kind of things. And so when you fast forward to about 30, I think I was about 35, um, I was, got a phone call after many years, probably about seven, and I was asked to come meet in Virginia. And so I went and I'm like, okay, I can connect some people really quick because I had stopped selling drugs for many years before that. And I was on my way to open up um, another business. And I said, I can connect some people really, really quick, get them together, I can make some money, and then I can be out. And it was actually a federal drug sting operation. And I was set up and I found myself arrested and put in a county jail in Virginia. And so now I'm here in Virginia and I'm like, okay, no big deal. There was no drugs in the case. This was all a conspiracy charge. You know, there was no weapons, there was no harm done. There was no money even exchanged. And I said, well, I'll bail out. I, can, I know this is not gonna be a problem. Well, I got to court in front of the judge for my arraignment and the judge said that I was a drug queen pin and a threat to society and gave me no bail. And so now I go back to the cell and you know, of course I'm crying because I'm like, how are they locking me up? Like, this is, crazy. This was an entrapment. This was a sting operation. There were no drugs. Nobody was harmed. Um, but that didn't matter. So I began to start going to whatever programming they had to offer. Often in prison, they don't offer programming. Um, they offer GED classes. And, you know, I didn't need that. Uh, they offer like knitting, crocheting and things like that. I didn't want to do that. Um, they had ESL classes, um, and of course I didn't need that. And then they had NA, Narconics Anonymous, and Alcohol and Alcoholic Anonymous classes. And so I decided to go to that, thought it would be interesting. Um, and it also selfishly, because I was in a cell from 21 to 23 hours a day alone and separated from the rest of the population because I was arrested as a federal detainee and they were under contract with a county jail from Virginia, the state of Virginia. So they had to keep us separate. And so um, the only time we were able to be together was when we were in programs. And so I would go to these programs and eventually I would just listen to the women talk about their stories of um, substance misuse, which is the proper language for addiction. 
And so um, when we went to the class, I remember one day asking a young lady, you know, like, why did you do drugs? Why did you do drugs? Because I had an idea that people just did drugs because they wanted to. Um, I had nobody in my family that was struggling with any kind of substance misuse. So I didn't see it um, really. If I saw people in the street, it would be, you know, who may have appeared to be inebriated or high, you know, or needed some money. I may have just like give a dollar, give five dollars and said, I did my good deed for the day and kept it moving. Like I had no real connection or really understanding. And this young girl who looked like one of my friends growing up, she said that her father had been raping her and he gave her heroin and told her to take the heroin to stop the pain. And another young lady said the only time she was able to spend time with her mom was when they smoked crack together. And when I heard them and really saw them, it broke my heart. And I remember crying and you know, apologizing, like how could I cause your harm to you and be a cause of your harm? And you know, they were like, we didn't get it from you, we got it from someone else. If, if it was you, we would, if we wouldn't get free me, we definitely would have gotten to someone else. And so, um, in that moment, you know, I was going to court and I could have went to trial. And if I lost trial, I was facing 20 years in prison. Um, or I could plead guilty. And I decided to because I was. And so I pled guilty. Um, I went on to go to federal prison and I got to federal prison and it was much of the same except the women in the county jail, they were really um, struggling financially, very poor, impoverished, didn't have access to jobs um, or any real healthy community and um, low levels of education, not finishing high school, many dropping out in middle school because they had to. Then in the federal prison, I was incarcerated with doctors, lawyers, senators, judges, people from high affluence, people with um, come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, people had great opportunities, great education, um, but yet the same underlying issues, which was sexual trauma, violence, substance misuse, um, and not enough healing. And so while there, I was convicted spiritually, is what some of us say, when we feel the spirit of God and God is like, wait, you know, you have to do something. Or sometimes we say it's intuition, sometimes we call it many other things. Um, but in that moment, I um, knew that I was supposed to come home and I was supposed to start the organization, the Leads of Hope Ministries, um, in order to, one, provide safe housing, uh, which is Mary, which you saw in the Bronx, um, and then, two, to be able to create platforms and opportunities for women to be able to use their voice to share their experiences while they were incarcerated. Because I felt that if people really saw uh, what, what women were going through, and what their children were going through, that women would not be put in prison for the things that they were being put in prison for. And that's what got me here. Um, so you were very inspired by um, the women you met in prison and, and that really changed your experience and your outlook on, on life. Um, did any injustices you witnessed or injustices you're still witnessing in the criminal justice reform, the um, in the justice system that um, that really continue to motivate you today. Thank you, and that's a great question. Um, what I noticed was that again, they were you know crimes of poverty or crimes of survival mostly uh, that people were being incarcerated for. Uh, women specifically were being sentenced to double the rate of men to life imprisonment. Um, that's also happening today. That, you know, women are 85% of all women who are incarcerated are mothers of dependent children, which meant that you have all of these children, upward of 10 million children, who are impacted by parental incarceration. So they have one parent who, have, who is in the system or has been in the system. Um, when I think about healthcare and I think about access um, that way, because of course women have different types of maternal health, reproductive health, and healthcare issues, that we did not have that access, and we, you know, end up having to pay at the time for, you know, our basic hygiene products like sanitary napkins or tampons. Um, we weren't just given those things; we actually had to pay for them. 
The other thing is, you know, you don't get balanced meals. People are like, oh, you know, you go to prison, you eat good, you get somewhere to sleep, there's nothing to worry about. I would hardly call eight pieces of white bread and tricolor bologna a healthy meal. Um, and often that's exactly what you were served, out of date milk, um, you know, this juice at any time you drank the juice, your stomach would cramp like, it felt like you there was metal going through your body, uh, which obviously once you did that one time, you wouldn't do it anymore. Um, you know, there's women, again, a lot of rape um, and abuse and from guards, correctional officers. You know, um, when you're incarcerated, you're under, you're considered the property of the state or the federal system or the government. Um, and so there's no such thing as consensual sex with another person while you're incarcerated. And so often, you know, people are being, you know, preyed upon because of the situation that they're in. And then, you know, they've been pregnant, impregnated, raped severely, and those type of things. Um, the distance between where women and their families are because there are prisons and jails all over the country for the United States, um, that often you may live in New York, like where I was from, but or where I'm from, but I was incarcerated in uh, Connecticut and then also in Illinois um, within the system. And they'll transfer you if there's not enough bed space sometimes. They'll transfer you because they're not meeting their quota at other institutions. It could be for programming, many things. And if you have people who don't have access to resources, then that's leaving you, you know, disconnected from your family. Phone calls, you know, $3.85 per call. In some cases, you're paying that a minute. Um, in county jails around the country, you have to pay to stay. So you actually pay uh, some, it's a dollar. I've seen up to $5 a day that you're charged for being in prison. So you're already in prison. The state is giving the, the prison money for you being in prison, thousands of dollars, sometimes over $100,000 a year, um, but yet you still have to pay a dollar to $5. Often people are there because they couldn't afford bail. So how can they afford to pay to pee in jail? And then even after they leave, if their debt isn't paid while they're there, that debt follows them as a collections account that goes on their credit. And, you know, of course you're in, very, very tiny space, uh, no ventilation, no air. Often you don't even get an opportunity to go outside. I know people who've been incarcerated five, 10, 20 years in some prisons that they were in for five or more years, they never went outside. So never actually saw a natural light. Um, there were no windows. And, and to think about how a person is going to come out of that situation without giving the right resources and not actually having the, act, the help or access to certain um, health requirements is going to damage anyone worse than what they were going in. And I mean, I can go and, 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 but I'll stop there for now. Uh, could you tell us more about um, the price of not helping people in prison and how that affects when they re-enter into society. Let's say that one more time. I'm sorry, you cut out on the first. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can you tell? Can you tell us more about the heavy price um, that the government pays when they don't invest in prisons? Because, um, and what happens after um, incarcerated people leave and re-enter society? Mm -hmm. So when you know the government is is. I guess, investing in the prison to keep people in prison. However, not investing in programming that helps to support people when they leave prison. Uh, what happens is you have people who end up coming out unhealed, who end up then having uh, no access to additional resources, uh, socialization skills, and or access to employment, housing, and then they go back to prison. Uh, you know, they call with women, often they call it prostitution. Some women call it, you know, survivor sex because they are forced to have to go into that type of work is what they call it because they um, cannot get a job. Many will try to apply, but because the conviction, there's a barrier. 
So you have this conviction, you do a background check, comes back, you're terminated immediately, or you don't even get to start. And so when you're trying to, you know, do the right thing, you're trying to work, you're trying to be a tax paying successful person back into society, yet there are all of these barriers that prohibit you from doing so. Um, it causes an effect that will actually keep people again um, in this cycle of abuse uh, now from the state. And then it also will cause additional harm to their children. So after you um, were released from prison, you started this amazing organization called the Ladies for Hope Ministries. And I would love to learn more about like what, how you and um, the Ladies for Hope Ministries are helping um, formerly incarcerated women, both in and out of prison currently? Sure. So we have uh, two approaches to our work. One is direct service and sustainability, and the other one is advocacy and engagement. Uh, what we know, like everyone who's on this call, you cannot uh, think about a successful life if you have no place safe to live, food to eat, and an equitable opportunity, whether that's through education, employment and or entrepreneurship. So we combat that work first. So we do Hope House, which is a safe housing space for women and girls who are coming home from prison jail, aging out of foster care or any other system, domestic violence um, or abuse. We have our Angel Food Project, which supports families impacted by incarceration and COVID now uh, who don't have the money to get healthy food. And so we partner with Instacart, Whole Foods, Wakeman's, um, Costco, other supermarkets where we give out bags of groceries every single day, seven days a week uh, to families. Then we have our Pathways for Equity program, which is a program that connects people to career development opportunities, partnering with corporate partners. So that way people actually have an opportunity to have a great career, not just a job, but a career, a decision-making role in a, in a corporation. And so um, we've partnered with many companies. Chanel is one, um, Virgin Orbit is another, which I'm going to LA to meet them, Long Beach next week. Um, so I think it's kind of cool that women who are coming from prison will actually have an opportunity to go out of space one day. So that's pretty cool um, through that program. And then on our advocacy and engagement side, the other thing we know is that you cannot be empowered to change your present conditions if you're not empowered to use your voice. And um, so with Faces of Women in Prison, we train women on how to be public speakers. And also as a pathway uh, for equity, we train them how to be paid as public speakers. That often people use their voice to share their traumatic experiences and relive these experiences, yet they take off of work if they have a full-time job, they have to find childcare, um, and they deserve to be compensated. So through that program, we've now trained 50 women through that program, um, and that's super exciting. Our, we have one cohort that's graduating Friday, which was um, supported by the NFL, um, inspire change. So that was pretty cool um, on women who have been subjected to police violence. And then we have our Epic Ambassadors work where we train uh, women both inside of prisons, um, in community, and also girls ages 16 to 21 to draft and write legislation, partner with local elected officials um, to get bills passed to end poverty and incarceration of women and girls. And um, that's super exciting. So we're in our cohort there. We have a doula training program where we uh, trained 50 women recently to be birth doulas. Uh, so they can go into prisons and help support women who are pregnant in prison, but also in community for people who cannot necessarily afford an alternative way to um, give birth that we decided that we were going to partner um, with a few healthcare providers in order to make sure that they're compensated while doing that work. And then there's you. And so with you, you'll have to tell everyone about study buddies because that was not my grand idea, it was yours. Um, but it's important that while we're doing all of the things that help women transition and you know our programming starts while they're inside also. But all the things that we do, part of this is not only for them to rebuild and strengthen their life, but also a lot of times it's for them to get their children back. Um, and to keep their children in safe environments and stop the cycle of abuse. 
I just want to emphasize that this is Topeka. She runs it all, every program that you've listed. It's truly incredible how much, how much you can do. Um, and I think this is a great segue into uh, the Study Buddies program. And um, if you're on the Zoom call, then you're probably interested in working with the program or being a Study Buddies. And right now, um, what we're trying to do as a program is pair incarcerated or the children of incarcerated men and women with high school mentors. Um, right now, it's a lot from New York City and boarding schools. And, um, and we want to make this this pair so that you can um, so that these children who have who have not had their parents in their life not have had the support that I've been blessed with and I know that a lot of you you all have um, and just and to have this person who can be their advocate who can inspire them to through education and through um, much more than that because the program is going to be um, it's going to be tutoring, but also you can, you're going to be an advocate for your student. You're going to help, help them get involved in sports and help them. And obviously I'll, I'll lead you all, um, study buddies, but, and give you direction, but you're going to help them maybe apply to a charter school or get them or help them just be their advocate, the advocate that I've, my parents have been in my life and I'm sure your parents have been in yours and, um, that they that they don't have in their life because this the criminal justice system is just against them and um, so Topeka you said that ten million children have been affected or have had one parent or two parents incarcerated do you see a program like Study Buddies actually making a difference and what difference do you think that could be in the children's lives that you've worked with and you've seen. Well, I definitely know that it will make a difference. It's making um, a difference now, just talking to different people about this opportunity and kids, and they're super excited. Um, as you know, especially now with COVID and you know limited school schedules in many areas, or overcrowding of schools and even others, that um, children don't have that person that they can, that one-on-one -on -one person they can go to. Often in certain communities um, and socioeconomic backgrounds, you can't afford a tutor or someone that can support. Um, when you are thinking that you wanna do something but you've never seen it, you don't have that access. And so to be able to be connected to other students who actually have particular access to provide opportunities to your partner or your, your buddy, um, if you will, will be huge. And it also, you know, think about something that Mary said, just how you know, having her parents there for her and even myself when I was in school, you know, being able to come home to my parents and being able to sit down and do homework and being able to, you know, jump on the phone if need be at any time. You know, these children don't have that opportunity. Um, often some of them are living in foster care or going, you know, in between family members and the foster care system uh, and don't have stable housing or stable environments. And so even to have a stable friend or someone that they're building a relationship with that they know is invested in their success will be critical to even their own mental health and wellness uh, and also to their just peace, you know? So I'm excited because I know you have a mighty group that you're starting with, but this is going to really, really be a huge once, you know, students and or schools and others hear about what you're doing. Yeah, I think something unique about the program is not just another tutoring, it's not just another tutoring program, it's actually working on building a connection from student and other high school the high school student and the um, the child. And I think that friendship is really important because it it allows for just more support and to the, for the child to feel supported and that someone believes in them, someone cares exact about what they're doing and someone's making sure that they they're doing their homework and that they're they're doing well in their classes. And then they're also excelling outside of the classroom and having great friendships. And this is all stuff that the program um, that study bodies will be prepared to make sure in their students and ensure in their students. And then um, I want to add to that, Mary, to that point that you just made, that the students are absolutely going to be um, supported. But I also believe that the buddies are going to be so fulfilled. 
I mean, you know, even for me in the seat that I sit in, you know, running this organization or leading this organization, that when a woman comes to Hope House and she tells me that I saved her life, that feels great, you know, knowing that I contributed to the safety and security and change of lifestyle for someone, you know, make, just warms my soul. And I know that, you know, for you to be able at such a young age to be a critical um, component on somebody's growth development and really their life, you too will see how that is going to impact you, um, not just now, but really forever. So I'm, I'm really um, excited to see how this also will change some of you um, because you'll be afforded to even see um, the way certain people have to live life that you fortunately uh, don't have to for many yeah. I think it'll definitely be impactful both ways. I know that my work um, and everything I've learned working with you is just, it's, it's just changed my life. And I, I see things so much, so, so differently now um, after just seeing the injustices that exist within the system that I never really thought of before. Um, so what advice would you have for study buddies, for a future study buddy who wants to make an impact on their student's life through academics and beyond? And yeah. I would say um, one is to be authentic, you know, be open, be honest, um, try to be relatable and whatever that looks like, uh, you know, as young people, I mean, as people, older people, as I'm older, uh, you know, we all tend to be judgmental sometimes, but try to check that at the door, uh, try to be consistent. It's incredible, it's incredibly important to be consistent with people. I mean, we want people in our lives to be consistent all day, whether it's our teachers, our friends, our parents, um, our food. <laughs> but I think that when we think about, again, a child who is already going through so much, just not having their parent there, um, consistency in effort is important. Um, also honesty is really important. If it's something that you can do, cool. If it's something you can't, be honest about it, right? Um, don't, what is it, over-promise and under-deliver. What you can do, say you can. If you don't know something, say you don't know. And if you can get the information, you get it. You're building also a network of people that if you don't know, you will know and that you can reach out to at any time. Um, but I'm sure as I think through, my list will keep going. Uh, but also what I would also say is don't be too intrusive, um, you know, even as it relates to like, why is your parent in prison? You know, I think that the person will offer that information to you when they're feeling most comfortable. Uh, and so know, like with every relationship, it is about building trust. And so you're going to be working with kids who have been made a bunch of broken promises have been, um, you know, people have been dishonest with them. You know, people have over-delivered, over-promised and under-delivered. And so just the, the, the way to be um, helpful is just to be truly as honest as possible. And also two more things, be accountable uh, to yourselves, to each other as a group. Uh, if you see that, you know, one of your, your colleagues, if you will, or, or kind of dropping the ball on their study buddy, check in. I think it's also important to check in on each other. You know, you all will be experiencing different levels of relationship with kids who have been through different levels of trauma. And so, you know, someone may dump something on you, want to talk to you about something. And so it probably would be really, really important to be able to find safe spaces and people that you can talk to and talk with. And we'll also have um, some additional resources like through Talkspace and other platforms that we use that you all will have access to while um, in this program as well. I think um, another aspect of Study Buddies that makes it a unique program is that um, kind of the untalked, not really talked about side of your parent going to prison is the relationship between the child and the mother or the father that suffers a lot um, while the um, all the parents incarcerated because oftentimes the child doesn't understand why why their parent had to leave or um, or there are a lot of struggles that go along with that. So um, my goal is that for every time you have a session with a student, like a forty five minute session, working through homework, talking about their day. Um, 
that the mother that you send an email or letter, depending on the prison that they're in, not because not all um, prisons have access to emails and computers, but um, detailing what's going on in the child's life so that they feel that they can be a part of their child's life. And it's not, so when they come, when the child um, has the opportunity to come to visit, it's not like they don't know, you guys don't, like the mother and the child don't know each other. There's something there. The mother knows what's going on and can ask questions and can feel like even though she has to be away, um, she can be a part of their life or he can be a part of um, his son or daughter's life. Um, so what would you say success? What would you emphasize is are the struggles in a relationship with a mother and child in prison or um, what would you emphasize in helping to build that relationship? I think you made a really, really great point, uh, Mary, that it is keeping the parent abreast and keeping the parent um, aware of where their child is on this learning journey, right? So they can, they too will be able to, you know, support them and cheer them on. Um, I'm hopeful that as we build relationships between the students and their schools, that also will be able to do different like progress reports and other things, even with the schools. Um, to see how we can also help to advance them in that way, get information from the school that can also help the study buddy in being able to be the best type of support necessary ahead of time. Um, success for the program to me is, I mean, it's successful already, to be honest. Uh, you have a lot of great interests and people are wanting to help. Uh, I think having getting one child uh, to consistently you know, do well in school, to be able to even understand that college is an option for them. Um, and to have access to, you know, different things that they may not have done before, you know, like playing instruments or, you know, playing particular sports. You know, I know, Aunt Mary, when you told me how passionate you are about squash and what you do, I'm like, wow, well, I'm sure there are a lot of kids that would even just like to go to a game and understand more about the game. Um, and then that might open up an opportunity for them. And so I think that, and also what it will do successfully is it'll show, um, you know, differences in just our, our world, like economically, socioeconomically, how there are different and there's classes and there are all, all these things. And some of us are fortunate enough to be born into it. Some of us have to work to get there. And then once we get there, we're able to have our children born into it. Um, and sometimes people don't ever get to see it. And so if you never get to see it and all you get to see are the things that are right outside of your doorstep, irrespective to what we see on social media, because by the way, I laugh often when I go to the explore page on like Instagram and I'm looking at things that they're sharing me like a bunch of kids, little babies, and I have no children. Um, a bunch of cats are kind of animal videos and I have none of those. Um, you know, food, I do love food, but you know, the, the algorithms and how they're determining things I guess I like or things I need to like, it's, you know, interesting, but I share that to say that just because you have access to a tool, if you don't know how to use that tool in order to really understand the things that you need um, or where you want to go, because you, you cannot fathom it because you don't even understand that it's possible, um, it doesn't exist really. It's like a useless tool. And I think you all not only being a friend, but you are also a resource and a tool. And so um, that's that success of opening up those opportunities to kids who typically would not have them. Again, would be great. And seeing more of you, I don't know what you all wanna do for you know, your college career and beyond, but once you really, really understand the trajectory that happens to people who are incarcerated and their kids as a result, you know, whatever profession you go into, I believe that it will help you think about, are we hiring people with convictions to make sure they have second chances for their children? Are we supporting, you know, people, are we not being as biased as we once were because we had an opportunity to work alongside, you know, myself, a woman who's been previously incarcerated and also, you know, kids who are gonna have parents who are very different. So it's a great opportunity. So in general, what do you think, um success, your idea of success looks like for a program like Study Buddies and just criminal justice reform? What do you um, see in the future? 
Well, I think again, well, for, I guess if I want to quantify what success will look like the study buddies, I would like to see study buddies in every single uh, state in every single country eventually, right? That there'll be study buddies speaking 10 different languages because we have so much access um, because unfortunately there are prisons in every single place in the world. Um, and there are mothers there too. What I would like to see are more children having the ability to your point to go to charter schools or you know, have their choice in schools and also get to college and have that opportunity. Um, and success also, at least with this first group, is that whoever is signed up and whoever does decide to go to the, you know, to really, really stay with the program start January, that they are committed, uh, committed fully. And that's every session that they're attending, um, that they're not missing out again on, you know, working with their buddy and making sure that they have the things that they need, uh, that they can speak up if it becomes too much, right? Um, and being upfront and honest, I think that also will be successful, you know, a successful uh, metric for me. Yeah, I think that honestly, the best advice I would give to study buddies is that you're not going to know all the answers, like you said. Um, sometimes you might not know how to help on a certain problem on a homework, or you can't, you don't know how to go about helping your student in a particular area. And I would just say that if you're authentic and you own it when you don't know things, that will build a trust in a relationship that will matter just exponentially in the child's life. And I think it's, in, I think it's just, um, I'm so excited to have a great group of study buddies or future study buddies from all over. Um, everyone with different passions and talents. And I think you can share that with your student because there's so many, just sharing your talent and maybe inspiring a student to go down a certain route could change their life and it could change your life and um, it could really make a difference. So um, Topeka, thank you so much for being on this call. Um, I didn't get to introduce you earlier, but I just want everyone to know just the incredible work that she does with Ladies Hope Ministries. And honestly, every everything she touches, it's just, it just takes off. It's incredible. And um, Thank you for being my mentor and inspiration for um, study buddies. So now if you if you want to log off, you can there. We've we have some people who's asked some questions and I'd love to ask them of you. Um, no, no, no. I'm here for you and for the okay. group. So whatever you have, I see there are questions coming up. Yeah. Can, go ahead. So the first question, um, do here we go. have things changed since your time in prison? Uh, yes and no. Um, so I say yes, they've changed, whereas I have noticed since I've been home more of a national conversation around incarceration uh, and women, like a, a huge influx. And part of that, you know, I will also attribute to the work of the Ladies of Hope Ministries uh, have been able to bring women in the forefront around the conversation of how incarceration impacts women. Um, the changes, there have been some decarceration efforts releasing people from prison as a result of that, uh, but the conditions of confinement are still inhumane and um, you know things are still really, really harsh while in prison, so. Okay, so we had a next question. Um, as a high school student, how can we best support incarcerated women and kids of incarcerated parents other than applying to be a study buddy? Hmm. Well, there's many ways. <laughs> okay, so there's the study buddy program, which is why we're here today. Um, and that's how you can support the kids. If we're looking at how do we support incarcerated women, the mothers um, and kids directly want it would be mentorship, which again can be done through study buddies. Um, there can be ways to provide job opportunities. Uh, there's also ways to, you know, depending on what you do or what you have access to, making sure again that you know your friends, your your colleagues. Uh, everyone understands that it's important to give second chances to people. So just around employment opportunities, um, around housing opportunities, that people should not have to worry about something that they did 
five, 10, 15 years ago, but they paid their debt, but they can't find a safe place to live because the landlord won't take them because they had a prior conviction. Um, and just being empathetic and compassionate that, you know, the reasons that many people end up in prison are really because of mental health struggles, because of trauma that had not been healed, and or because of um, lack of access opportunity resources, which is that of poverty. Um, our next question is, have you had a mentor or figure in the past that has made a difference in your life or affected your work? Yeah, um, I've had a, min, a many. Um, my parents, number one, they were definitely uh, hardworking entrepreneurs uh, and gave me the ability to understand that I could do anything if I had hard work. So they've always been that for me. Um, also, Reverend Dr. Eleanor Moody Shepherd, who's actually my board chair now. I met her while I was incarcerated. And um, she was the head of students at New York Theological Seminary. And that's where my father had went. And that's another story about how they connected. But when I was inside, I was giving her a number to reach out to her. And she came to visit when I got to federal prison in Danbury, Connecticut. She came once a month um, there. I even was transferred to Greenville, Illinois, and she flew there. And she um, now is 80 something years old. So then she was 70 something. So she drove up there and then she flew there to see me. And um, it was a consistent person in my life who was older, who um, was there without judgment, who was able to show love unconditionally, who gave me the space to be honest and authentic, you know, about all the great things, but also the shortcomings. Um, and who was still instrumental in my life. You know, and then my friends, I mean, I have a lot of great, you know, mentors. I don't look at mentors as even people who are, you know, older, like Mary, you say I'm a mentor, but you're a mentor equally, right? Like, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter um, if you don't know something, but if there's something that strings your heart and you feel a need to do something, then as long as you have a mind to think, you can get it done. You showed me that. So, you know, I think um, you all would also be mentors to the students. So that's another, you know, great role to follow, great shoe, a role to fill. Um, another question we have is, do you know how COVID affected the rate of incarceration, uh, incarcerated women? Did the rate go up or down or stay the same? So there was, of course, more prison deaths because you cannot, you can't social distance while you're in prison, right? You can't, it's impossible to stay six feet away from someone, even the way you sleep. So there, of course, was a rise in prison deaths um, over the last year, both for women and men. Um, as related to COVID, what we did notice, even in the COVID le legislation um, or the, the CARES Act and other legislation that was uh, passed to at least people who were nonviolent and fit a certain criteria. Uh, women were not being released at the rate of men and women of color were even under that number. So uh, men were being sent home who had less sentences, the lesser sentences than their women uh, co-defendants, but even during COVID they had to sit in prison, were denied um, to be sent home while in prison often uh, the, the amount of prison deaths, I believe, recently a report came out that said that there were more women that actually died in prison than men during COVID. Um, and what boundaries would we, should we set with our study buddies? Um, could we text them if we got to that point? Could that be beneficial? Well, I think everything is about building a relationship with the person. I think it's also about building um, trust and that goes both ways, right? It's not just the study buddy needing to trust you, it's also you needing to trust, trust the study buddy. So, you know, I would implore you to take your time in building that out. Um, I'm not gonna say, you know, you'll never get to the point where you'll text each other. You know, everything is text-based. We'll probably develop some type of app where study buddies and their students can communicate that way. That way it's a safe, secure platform that you can use to do that. Um, and I know relationships develop over time, but you know, you want to keep it as, uh, what's the word? 
you want to keep it as as comfortable, but also as professional as possible, because uh, you want to be able to gain trust where if they have certain things going on, that they know that they can talk to you. But there's also a responsibility that if there are things going on that you need to let us know so that we can you know, best support and also make sure that no one is in harm. Um, Topeka, can you talk a little bit about what the kids of incarcerated parents are like? Have you noticed any common personality traits, attitudes towards school and education, and or needs in general among these among these students? That's a really good question. Um, what I've known is that they are just like me and you, you know, um, they're kids. And of course, many upset, you know, many feel lonely, many, um, some are angry because they miss their parents. They don't have access to the parents. Um, I think that any, again, any new relationship, I think it's important to build and to build trust. And in order to do that, that has to be rooted on honesty. I mean, often people who have been through those experiences, you know, or similar even experiences have difficulty trusting because of so much disappointment. And so, you know, you may be looked at as like, yeah, what do you want from me? You know, what are you getting to do this for me? Um, but remember, it's not personal, right? It's just a person who's actually um, communicating in the only language that they know how. And often that is defensive, um, but it's not personal. So I would say that I, I, I have seen that common kind of theme where, you know, around holidays, kids get sad. But obviously, if one of your parents aren't there, more, or less, more than even two, and you haven't received a Christmas gift since you were two, and now you're, you know, 18 or 17, and everybody else is talking about their mom or their dad and what they got for Christmas or what this dinner was like, and you don't have that, then there would be a level of sadness, right? Sometimes anger, sometimes other things. Um, but I will also say that, I have found the kids that live among with a lot of adversity work the hardest. And so what you will have are a group of resilient kids who feel that they have something to prove to the world anyway because of their circumstances. Um, so you will have someone, if you are able to build that relationship, that will be a dynamic. There are some clarifying questions about the program in general. Um, the goal is that you are, you sign up when you become a study buddies for the entire year. Um, this year would be January through um, June, whenever school ends and school gets out. Um, I'd be like, obviously, if you want to, if you want to take on more, you want to work through the summer, you want to, um, you want to take on extra sessions or extra students, that would definitely be a possibility because I'm totally excited about any, any interest and um, we have space for anyone who wants to be engaged. Um, but the commitment you make to a student is a year long commitment of weekly, weekly sessions and, um, and weekly writing to the letter to update the mother about their child's life. Um, but you only make the, you only make the, um, the commitment for one year and you can choose to come back the next year and work with the same student and keep that connection, um, build it, foster it, um, or you can take on, um, or you can take on more students and um, anything you want there. I just love to get more people engaged. And um, ideally in the future, we have meetings in person. We've talked about having museum yeah. trips or um, trips to a baseball game or getting exposure to things um, or going to like the Natural History Museum in New York or going to a music concert or things that expose the child to things outside their bubble or outside their world to, to show them that new things are possible. You can, there's not only one way to be successful in life. You can go to college, but there are other routes. You can f explore your passions. Um, just if a lot of people have been given the opportunities and said like, here's everything you can do, just pick one. I want to give the study buddies and people in the program the opportunity to follow their passions and find out what they're truly interested in. So thank you for those questions. Um,
And finally, there's one last question. It says, can we get matched based on ethnicity? I'm wondering if my ability to speak Spanish and Latino background could help me be more relatable and speak to a parent that could only speak in Spanish. Is it something that would be possible? How are you guys planning on matching the buddies? Well, I think that's a question that, you know, Mary, you and I can think about. I think yeah. you want to make sure that you're relatable. You don't want to automatically put a person uh, with someone based on ethnicity, right? Just because you, you don't want to seem biased in that way. But I think if also you have a skill, right? Like you can, you're bilingual, it might, or more languages, I just saw Spanish. Um, and you're able to actually communicate with the parent who may not be able to, um, you know, speak English. And so you want to build that. That sounds great to me. Um, and I also think that that child, we can talk to the child and see if that's something that they want. But we want to make sure that people are connecting. So obviously, we want to make sure that there's something that's a similarity, kind of like, I guess, you know, I'm thinking about like a dating app or something where, you know, you both kind of put in your, um, your likes, your interests, and it'll match you with the person based on that. Maybe that's something we need to create, Mary Sue. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just kind of thinking this through. Yeah, I think um, that would be a good way to match. So, if you have a person who a buddy who wants because or they speak bilingual or they want someone uh, who does, then that would be helpful. So yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, it's a really interesting point of view. Um, so thank you all so much for coming on here. Um, Topeka, you've been great. Thank you for spending the time, taking the time out of your day to um, talk to everyone at um, Study Buddies. And if you all, if you all, anyone on the Zoom call has any questions, reach out to here. I can put the um, email in the chat, but. And thank you, Mary, before we go, you know, for again, you know, coming up with an idea to do work that impacted, that impacts the children, but also from your heart, right? Like you saw something, you met me and immediately were like, I have to do something and you've done it. And that is, you know, great leadership. And I'm incredibly proud of you. And even um, as equally proud of also the kids who are signing up students who are signing up to be a part of this because you all too are showing commitment to want to see work change in the world but also afford an opportunity to another child who likely would not have that opportunity without you and so um, I'm super grateful for this I'm grateful for you uh, Mary and for you know your leadership this is awesome and you've been a pretty good moderator I'll say that too I've done a lot of <laughs> I've done a lot of uh, speaking gigs and you the, the questions were great. So thank, you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, um, we're going to close the meeting. So thank you all for coming. And thank you to Pika and have a great rest of your night. Okay. Thank you. You too. Thanks, everyone.